Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 460th episode, we have a bunch of news, including how dinosaurs may have looked around, meaning with their eyes, and what that says about their intelligence. There's also another proposal for sexual dimorphism between male and female dinosaurs. Mm. And this time it might be real. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> some of the other ones were more controversial but it seems like people might be more into this one and we have an interview with Maz Maddox author of a series of books about humans who can shapeshift into dinosaurs and we have dinosaur of the day Wanonosaurus, as well as a fun fact but before we get into all of that we want to thank some of our patrons and we have two new patrons to thank this week there's Dr. Eric Nefarious and Bob Thank you both very much for joining. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Verociraptor, Karen, Ben at Jurassic Site B, Ermel, Rhinosaurus, Ian, Pamela, and Stefan. Awesome. Thank you so much for being a dino it all with us. Really appreciate your support. Jumping into the news, there was a cool open access article about gays following. And when I first read the title, I thought it was a little bit romantic, and I thought it would tie in well with our interview for this episode. It's uh, not so much about romance and more about intelligence, but still very cool. This was published in Science Advances by Claudia Zetrog and others. So humans and some other animals have this thing that we do called visual perspective taking. And that's if you reposition yourself to see what someone else is looking at when you can't initially see it because there's something blocking your view. That's also known as visual perspective. And it's a complex but important social skill. And it turns out that dinosaurs started doing this at least 60 million years before mammals developed that skill. That is a lot of time of pointing at things and looking at what the other thing is pointing at. Mm -hmm. Or I guess it doesn't necessarily have to point. It could otherwise indicate, I guess, just by looking intently. Yeah, there are different ways to do it. As a quick note, in humans, kids between one and a half to two years old start to develop this ability. And it helps later with communication, like if someone's giving you directions or you're telling stories based on pictures. And it also helps with understanding other people and knowing that they hold different viewpoints from your own. Hmm. A little bit of empathy. Mm -hmm. I've definitely noticed kids when they start to learn to look around stuff. And that's really cute. Yeah. They move their big bobbleheads. But I haven't noticed like one kid looking and then like or the transition between when they might like gather up to look in the same direction. Oh, I know with our daughter, we notice that if we're pointing or looking at something, she'll look in that direction but i off the top of my head i can't remember if she will actually move herself (laughs) like to to us to look or maybe there's a block in the way of whatever we're looking at if she was gonna move somewhere else so the block isn't in her way okay so you don't necessarily have to move over to the person to like get their perspective from it yeah you could just move somewhere else in order to see what they're pointing at exactly or indicating okay I guess that is pretty complicated because you have to have that social ability to know that the other people are seeing the same kinds of things that you might see. You have to understand that they're indicating it and you have to know what to do with your body so that you can put that piece together. Yeah. So this visual perspective taking, it's key in evolving social cognition. That's the way that you process, remember, and use information in social contexts to explain and predict yours and other people's behavior. And it lays the foundation for referential communication. The most basic form of perspective taking is that you stop being self-centered and become more concerned with the interests of others. Now, there's low-level gaze following, and that's where you look at what someone else is looking at, and you look in that direction too. And in humans, that starts somewhere between three and six months old. This type of gaze following, the gaze following into the distance, has been found in all amniotes studied, mammals, birds, reptiles. Then there's high-level gaze following, and that's like what we were just describing. You move yourself to see the thing that the gazer is looking at, and that's much more advanced. Visual perspective taking has so far been seen in apes, some monkeys, dogs, corvids, ravens and rooks, and starlings all lineages that rose after the end Cretaceous extinction. But not much is known of how this 
skill originated or evolved. Yeah, because those are pretty different. I mean, you've got some pretty far down the family tree mammals as well as birds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it seems like it might have evolved separately in those cases. So for this study, the researchers compared paleonaths, the most primitive or as they put it, quote, neurocognitively least derived and quote, living birds. Uh, that's like the nice way of saying dumb. <laughs> yeah. They include ostriches, kiwis, cassowaries, the flying bird, tinamous, and more. And they also compared them with crocodilians, the closest living relatives of birds. Yeah, it's interesting to think, can crocodiles do this fancy gaze following? Spoiler, they can't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Because that'd be the easy way. If birds do it and crocodiles do it, then the, most of the things where birds and crocodiles do the same thing, we go, oh, dinosaurs probably did. Yeah. It makes it's, it more complicated when they not, do it. Yeah, it's not that straightforward. Uh, Paleoanatic brains are comparable to non avian dinosaurs. Crocodilian neuroanatomy has pretty much stayed the same for hundreds of millions of years and is similar to the common ancestor of dinosaurs and crocodilians. So, yeah, still very helpful for comparison purposes. The team tested 30 animals, five species, six animals per species. Specifically, it was emus, greater rheas, elegant crested tinamous, red jungle fowl. That's the species that gave rise to chickens. It's not a paleonath, but they added that as an outgroup. And American alligators. That's a fun fact. I never knew the red jungle fowl was where chickens came from. Yeah, same. There's a lot about chickens we don't know, and it keeps popping up in different ways for me. Yeah. Different fun facts about chickens. <laughs> I read a whole thing on chicken sexual dimorphism, too. Oh. But I ended up not using it. It might come in a future fun fact or something. <laughs> Maybe a future chicken episode. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> anyway, for this paper, they did three experiments uh, following gaze up looking up, following gaze to the side, and following the gaze to something behind a barrier. And like I spoiled earlier, they found that alligators do not do visual perspective taking, though they will turn their head or gaze towards something someone else is looking at. They'll follow their gaze to a visible location. As you were describing those different ways of looking around, I was thinking, yeah, dogs definitely do that because you can do that thing where you like look really quickly mm -hmm. and the dog always like jerks its head like, what are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> they often run to look at something too. Oh, well, that's true. But I guess with a crocodile, if you do that quick look, they might look too. Mm -hmm. But if they don't see anything, then they're just going to be like, okay, whatever. In this case, an alligator. But oh, yeah. yeah. Crocodilian. Yeah. And the alligators also didn't follow their gaze as often as birds to those visible locations. And they didn't follow the gaze upward, but instead they turned around. And that could be because they spend time in the water and mainly raise their heads to see further ahead over the water surface rather than up. And that would be behind and not above them. So they're not looking upwards. They're turning around to look. But they did find that all the birds tested do visual perspective taking. Birds also do this thing called checking back, where they look back into the eyes of the gazer and then retrack the gaze if they couldn't see anything the first time they looked. And it shows that there was an expectation to see something. Hmm. So all the birds, all the emus, the everything does that? Yeah, all the birds. So this probably means that all birds do visual perspective taking, since the birds in the study, quote, <laughs> represent some of the neurocognitively most conserved taxa, end quote. Unless it was lost secondarily, this ability. So this is expanding on before when you said that we knew corvids do it. Now we know that all these birds do it? Yes. Wow. Because the paleonaths, again, have the um, neurocognitively least derived brains. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're the least intelligent. It just means that they're, in this case, the closest to dinosaurs because they've changed the least over time. Exactly. Now, birds have a higher density of neurons and expanded cerebellum. That's the part of the brain at the back of the skull. It helps with motor control and cognitive processes. And it's higher and more expanded compared to crocodilians, which might be why birds do this checking back, but not alligators. This suggests that visual perspective taking started with the dinosaurs at some point, and it's likely that dinosaurs started doing it a lot earlier than mammals. 
In mammals, so far, it's only been seen in some primates and canids, dogs and wolves, quote, which are members of two separate groups that emerged independently roughly 60 million years later than the latest probably appearance of visual perspective taking in dinosauria, end quote. And that's why they're saying that dinosaurs were probably doing this 60 million years before mammals. Yeah, and that's conservative because you said that's the latest Mm -hmm. probable appearance. Yes. Could be earlier. Yes, exactly. So it might have been even earlier than even dinosaurs. Oh, geez. Yeah. It's just probably, I guess they're saying after crocodilians and archosaurs split off. Because if crocodilians don't have it, then they Mm. don't think the common ancestor had it, I suppose. Yeah, something like that. Although you can't rule out maybe crocodilians just lost it later once it became aquatic or something. Right. It does seem less likely that the earliest dinosaurs were doing this, though, because they had more alligator-like brains. Now, paleonaths have been around for 100 million years. You mentioned before, their brains are more similar to non-avian dinosaur brains compared to a crocodilian. It's similar in size, shape, proportions between areas, and the relationship between the body and brain size. But it's unclear if the neuronal density was similar between paleonaths and non-avian dinosaurs. Yeah, we don't have a really well-preserved brain tissue where we could look at how dense the neurons were. Yeah. <laughs> That would be some epic fossilization. It would be. (laughs) Not to say it'll never happen, but we don't have it now, that's for sure. Now, it does make sense that dinosaurs did this visual perspective taking before mammals because they had better vision. Mammals were mostly nocturnal, especially in the early days. Yep. It's all about smell and hearing when you're around at night. Mm -hmm. The daytime, you want the good eyes. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't until primates and certain carnivores that mammals' visions improved. Makes sense with primates because we're very visual. Mm -hmm. Now, if visual perspective taking wasn't convergent evolution for mammals. Meaning dogs and primates got it from the same distant ancestor. Yes. Then it should be found in lots of animals since the split of the common ancestor of primates and carnivora originated to well before the end of the Cretaceous, but, quote, still roughly 40 millions of years after its origins in dinosaurs. So again, it's not surprising if it evolved earlier in dinosaurs than mammals. There's an increase in neurons seen in mammals and birds, probably due to endothermy being more warm-blooded or, you know, you generate your own heat. And also dinosaurs had acute vision. Mammals were, again, initially and for a long time, primarily nocturnal, so... Like you were saying, Garrett, the vision just wasn't as important as senses like smell. And primates, though, they're diurnal. We're awake during the day, most of us, (laughs) and we have better vision. So this study shows that mammals weren't the first to have these complex superior intelligence or drive even the evolution of complex cognition. Mammals weren't the ones to start this after dinosaurs went extinct. We still need to do more research to better understand the evolution of social cognition, but it's just interesting because I think a lot of times in the past, people have talked about, well, mammals rose up after the dinosaurs and then they got really smart and, you know, that's how they were able to take over. But birds were getting smarter too after the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. Yes. And dinosaurs may have been smarter than we think. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe those right after the KPG boundary, after the Chicxulub impactor wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs, maybe birds were smarter than mammals for a little while, because if they had this fancy ability to see things and sort of communicate it, maybe inadvertently, maybe intentionally, then it wasn't just about intelligence that made mammals take over. Yeah, exactly. So like I said at the beginning of this segment, Initially, I thought this was a kind of romantic thing, but it has to do with intelligence that still ties in really well with our interview lately. Did you think it was romantic because like gaze, like they're gazing at each other? Yes, that's exactly what I thought. Because I I don't know, something about the word gaze, I just think gaze lovingly. Mm -hmm. But really just means looking, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which I guess can also be a romantic thing. Yeah. All right, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break, but when we get back, I'm going to talk all about the latest and greatest in sexual dimorphism studies. 
All right, now that we're done talking about gazing, we can move on to how dinosaurs looked physically instead of how they looked at each other. So (laughs) we've got another group of researchers trying to tease out sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. It's a very popular topic. This one was written by Romain Pintor et al. in eLife. And really, biologists have been fascinated by sexual dimorphism for centuries. Darwin was a little bit obsessed with the difference between male and female species, Hmm. including birds and so I guess technically dinosaurs, but many other groups as well. Some birds have pretty big differences between males and females. Male birds are often much more colorful. One of my first memories actually is being amazed that the mallard ducks in a creek by my house were the same species as the females, despite being way more colorful. I was like, how can they be the same? That one's brown and that one's like got a bright green head. That doesn't make sense. (laughs) I had the same thoughts. (laughs) Yeah. But obviously the dinosaurs of ducks in this case with their plumage are obviously different sexes because you can see it in the coloration. But with the fossil record, we don't have plumage most of the time to go by. So we have to do it based on the bones, which is much more difficult. So a lot of times what we're going for is the size difference because it's pretty easy to tell if one bone is bigger than another. So if you think you see that there's a group of bones that are bigger and a group of bones that are smaller, then you might say, okay, well, maybe the bigger group of bones are from a male dinosaur or a female dinosaur and the smaller is from the other sex. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. It never is. With birds, male birds are usually larger than females, but there are many exceptions. (laughs) Basically, all birds of prey, aka raptors, as well as hummingbirds, have larger females than males. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know it about the hummingbirds. Yeah. We've talked about it before with raptors, and because of that, some paleontologists have used that similarity to say that the larger predatory dinosaurs may have been female because the larger predatory birds today are females. Mm -hmm. But that is quite a stretch after 70 plus million years of evolution. (laughs) Yes. Especially because the quote unquote birds of prey aren't the only birds that actually eat meat. It's Mm -hmm. not like, oh, you eat meat. The females are bigger. It's more like this specific group of birds that eat meat. The females are bigger. But you can find plenty of other groups of birds where the males are bigger and they're eating insects or little lizards or something. So in this new study, they were specifically looking for sexual dimorphism in a presumed herd of oviraptorosaurs. They used the Anjac Charente Lagerstata in western France. That's a mouthful. Yeah, it's also the first part is French and the second half is German, which is a little unusual. But it basically, that's the name of where the bones were found. And then Lagerstata means like a super awesome find of dinosaur bones. I was going to say, yeah, usually well preserved, <laughs> like when you think of Archaeopteryx. Yeah, it doesn't have to be dinosaurs. You can have a Lagerstata of like any kind of fossil, but in our case, it's always about dinosaurs. This specific Lagerstata is a pretty new discovery. The dinosaurs were first found there in 2008. Hmm. So, way, way newer than Archaeopteryx, for example. <laughs> and for our British listeners, this Lagerstata is about the same age as the Purbeck group in Dorset and the surrounding areas in southern England, and that puts the date at the very beginning of the Cretaceous, between about 140 and 145 million years ago, likely pretty close to the middle of that range. This Lagerstata is important because it has a lot of ornithomimosaurs buried together, it looks like. Presumably, the leading theory at the moment is that they were in a herd together, Mm -hmm. a huge group of ornithomimosaurs, just like the group running around of Gallimimus in Jurassic Park. But in this case, rather than just running through a field and a couple getting chomped by a T-Rex, all of them got wiped out by a flood, at least all the ones that fossilized. So basically, they think all these ornithomimosaurs were in a group together, living in a herd, and then they got very quickly fossilized together, which, if you're looking for differences between individuals, is pretty ideal. Because in general, say you're trying to look at Triceratops in the US, and you've got one in Wyoming, and then you've got one in Colorado, and then maybe you've got two in Montana, and you're digging them up one at a time all over the place, it's impossible to know if they lived on the same day. Mm -hmm. Or even the same within 100,000 years of each other in most cases. You just know that they got buried 
plus or minus about a million years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big plus or minus. Yeah, which means that there could have been a lot of change between, even if it's the same species, could have just been a different group of that animal where some are bigger. Because we get that today, where groups of birds that are farther north or farther south can be bigger or smaller just by variation. Depending on the diet in different areas, you can get bigger or smaller. So really the ideal is to have as many animals together that were living in the exact same time, in the exact same place, eating the same food, potentially being related or mating with each other so they're all as closely related as you could possibly get and then you can compare those so that you're pretty confident that you're not looking at different species and you're not looking at a whole lot of differences that you might have from environmental factors. Mm -hmm. E-Life has an editor's evaluation which I really enjoy. <laughs> the editor said quote this important contribution offers a convincing analysis of the challenging topic of sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. Unlike previously published contributions, which are ambiguous, this paper, based on 61 ornithomimosaur fossils, makes a compelling case for measurable differences between male and female individuals, end quote. It's quite the endorsement. I know. I like that a lot. I also like the throwing shade at all the previous papers of like, yep. <laughs> which are ambiguous, <laughs> because that is always what we say with every paper we've covered up to this point, where it's say it's T-Rex. And you say, well, these are bigger and those are smaller. And we say, well, maybe one of them is one sex and one is the other. Or maybe they were just bigger or maybe they were just still growing at the time. It's always hard to tell. But the more individuals you get, the better your statistical power get and the better likelihood you have of actually finding a difference between two groups. So unfortunately, though, despite having a minimum of 61 individuals, their statistics don't have an N of 61. They didn't use all 61 in any of the analyses they did. Mm. So one analysis used 10 bones, which is good, mm -hmm. but not particularly statistically powerful. And the other had 19. So for the 10, the reason there are so few is they needed the full femur they need an entire complete bone that's in pretty good shape and not distorted or broken or anything like that in order to do their analysis. So they only had 10 of those that they could use. Oh, okay. Still, 10's not bad. It isn't. And then the other one, they were using the bottom end of the femur and they were looking at some pretty subtle details. So they had to be in really good shape too in mm -hmm. order to see the difference. For the full bones, that when they were using the entire femur, they did a principal component analysis on it basically looking for any sort of consistent variation that you could find between them that would sort of separate out groups. And what they found is that there's a pretty characteristic curve to some of the femurs while the other ones are much more straight. Hmm. And this is something that's found in a lot of birds as sexual dimorphism. Oh, interesting. That's helpful. Yeah. And it's also nice because it's not just purely size. Because whenever it's purely size, you can say, oh, well, maybe it was just a younger individual. Right. Or individual variation. Yeah, exactly. Or just a smaller individual. But in the case of looking at the curve, it's not going to be like, well, this one just happened to have its femur in a more curved phase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what we see in the modern analogs is that one sex has a more curved femur and the other one has a straighter femur. That is a pretty good indication. It is. And then the other one, the 19 that they had for the bottom end of the femur, it's a little more subtle. You kind of have to know what you're looking at, but it's essentially the width of that base of the femur. Mm. In both of these groups with their principal component analysis, the groups were about 50-50 between the categories, and they were also really far separated apart on the chart. It wasn't like some charts where you see there's kind of like this the circle and it overlaps and there's like a lot of Venn diagram happening in the middle. And the researchers are like, well, we think all those belong in this group and we think all these belong in that group. In this one, it's they're pretty clearly defined. The, there's a lot of separation between the two. Hmm. And that's not something you usually see in these sexual dimorphism studies, especially when you're talking about size. There's always like something in the middle and then you have to decide, oh, is that... Uh, on this side or is it on that side because a lot of it is mixed up with things like how big that individual was due to age or other factors than just what sex it was the other cool thing about them being about 50 50 between the categories means that the ratio between the sexes is almost exactly one to one. Oh, and that isn't always the case there are lots of situations where there are more females than males yeah and we might be able to use that to sort of extrapolate some behavior between the animals. There's something about like when females are selecting their partner, the ratio tends to go more one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And so there's interesting things we might be able to say with that. Although again, we're extrapolating 
based on modern animals back way into the distant past. Yeah, so it's hard to know. Yeah, but I like that they're about one-to-one because most animals, many animals today, you have roughly one-to-one. If in their analysis, they had their bones right, and in one analysis, you've got 80-20, and in the other one, they're (laughs) 50-50, you'd think like, wait a second. But in this case, it's nice that they match up, that they did two analyses and they both gave a similar ratio. Very similar. Just makes it seem even more legit. It does, yeah. Unfortunately, they didn't determine which sex the bones were from. So they didn't say like the more curved ones are female and the straighter ones are male or vice versa. That's hard to know. I think they might do it in the future, though, because this is based on modern birds. Yeah. And I don't know which is which, you know, what in modern animals, whether the female or the male tends to be the curved one or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they might be able to combine it with that ratio between the sexes to figure out which one's which. But that's sort of their future analysis. And it might also just be that (laughs) we sometimes joke about researchers publish like the minimum they can for a paper (laughs) because there's a lot of pressure to publish a lot of papers. Mm. So you don't want to put all of your findings, all your, you know, years worth of work into just one paper if you can stretch it out into a couple papers. I see. So that could be why they're sort of limiting the scope of this one paper. Or maybe there's just more to study too. Yeah, that's true. They might not be done. Well, that is cool. I was wondering how this was going to be different from the other sexual dimorphism studies. Yeah, it's very different because Almost all the ones that we've looked at are about the size Mm -hmm. and just like the just straight up like circumference or diameter of a bone. But this one is a little more nuanced and it makes you wonder, well, maybe this sort of factor can be used in other dinosaur bones, too. Maybe other groups have this sort of curve to them. Yeah, certainly maybe in other ornithomimosaurs, but it's we'll have to see if people see it in other theropods or not. Yeah, that's exciting. Now we're going to pause for one more ad break, but when we get back, we'll get on to our interview with Maz Maddox. And now on to our interview with Maz Maddox, but of course, as always, we have an extended version of this interview. So if you'd like to hear more about the Relic series, then make sure to check it out in your premium content feed if you're a patron. And if you're not a patron, it's a great time to join so you can get some more premium content. Hint, hint. (laughs) We are talking this week with Maz Maddox, who is a fellow dinosaur enthusiast. We've actually met through SVP and a, and a few other things, which is really exciting. And Maz is also the author of the Relic series about humans who can shape shift into dinosaurs. I should mention these books have a lot of romance and adult content. We'll also probably mention lots of spoilers in this interview. And Maz is also the author of a lot of other great books, but being a dinosaur podcast, we're going to focus on the dinosaur ones. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be here. All right. You clearly did a lot of research for the Relic series, and we know you have a dinosaur background working with the Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs. Could you tell us a little bit about how all that came together for this series? So it was kind of a weird combination of a bunch of different things all at once. Like I've, of course, been a longtime dinosaur kid since I was a child, like growing up with Jurassic Park and Land Before Time and all that good stuff. And then, you know, later down in in life, I was able to do just a little bit of paleontology in college, getting to work with the Arlington Archosaur site before it was, I want to say, acquired by the Perot Museum. I don't know exactly (laughs) how how they got it, but (laughs) it's theirs now. But before it was, I was able to work with the Dr. Derek Main, who was the person over that site uh, before his passing. So I was able to go out there and do some dinosaur fossil digging and and things like that, which of course was like a dream come true since I was like 20 something and I'd been loving dinosaurs my whole life. Fast forward, I, you know, out of school, I wasn't able to get a degree or anything, but I continued my obsession with dinosaurs into adulthood, was able to accidentally stumble into not only y'all's podcast, which got me connected with some other cool dinosaur stuff. But I think from y'all's podcast was how I learned about the Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs, connected with them and was able to do their social media stuff for a little while. I was able to go to SVP, meet you guys in person, get to like meet other paleontologists from Rub Elbows and stuff. So of course, at that point, I was a full-blown dinosaur nerd. (laughs) Like I was like reading articles and doing the whole thing and, and wanting to get back into it. So In 2020, me and my husband moved from Texas to Wisconsin, and 
as soon as we arrived in Wisconsin, we couldn't leave the house. So I was miserable, stuck in this apartment, knew nobody up here. And so I decided on a whim to write this book that I had lingering in the, in the back of my head for a long time. And I was like, you know what? I have nothing better to do. So I'm just going to like bang out this manuscript and put it out there. And if anyone likes it, great. But if not, it was just for me, it was a cathartic kind of thing. So when I released it, I got way more attention for this series than my other one. So this one kind of, I would say blow up. I'm not like super popular making a million dollars or anything, but I got way more people interested in my work from Smash and Grab, which is the first one. And it turns out the people who were into romance and the people who like dinosaurs, it's not a Venn diagram. It's a circle. Like, so many people <laughs> are like hidden dinosaur nerds. I had no idea. So all of these people seem to come out of the woodwork and we're just like, oh man, like I love dinosaurs and I've always been a dinosaur kid and now it's in romance. I was like, oh man, I didn't realize there's so many people like, like who loved both things. So it's been a crazy fun experience. That's nice. amazing. Yeah. So there's five books in the series. Four have come out. It's what? Smash and Grab, Sink or Swim, King and Queen, Lost in Amber. And then coming out on September 22nd is Gardens and Ghosts. Mm -hmm. And you've got all these amazing, like the details of there's really great scientific details in the book. There's also all these amazing pop culture references. I actually didn't know about that dinosaur park in Kentucky until I read it. I was like, I need, maybe I need to check this out. But <laughs> there's a lot of also like interesting dinosaur sites and dinosaur related locations in all of these books. Did you go to all these places? Have you been to all these places? Because they seemed really, they came alive in the descriptions. <laughs> So I've been to some that are similar. Like I haven't been to the one in Kentucky, but I've been to recently I was able to go to Dinosaur World in Florida, which was amazing. <laughs> and then there's another one in Texas over by Glen Rose. They have a big dinosaur world out there. And it was so cheesy and so over the top. And <laughs> of course, anytime we go anything, anywhere dinosaur related, when my husband has to go with me to these places, he has to endure me being like extra there because not only am I excited and like being as thrilled as the little kids who are getting to see other dinosaurs but I'm pointing out all the like goofy weird inaccuracies mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like excitedly being like that doesn't have feathers and it should and I'm like skipping to the next one and he's like my god so because I have such an obsession with those I had to put it in the first book and of course to make it extra funny I had to make the person he went with a dinosaur mm -hmm. so then later he's like horribly embarrassed so <laughs> uh, but yeah i i love any chance i get to go to those like really kitschy americana dinosaur park things i'm i'm there for it i love those things it sounds like you're a little bit of a mix of the two characters in the first book then dalton and simon yeah for sure <laughs> like the dalton side of me is just happy to be there and i think it's funny and cheesy and i i love what it is but i'm definitely the simon being like wow that's super wrong and i'm gonna tell <laughs> everyone who's around me, why it's wrong, whether they, they want to hear it or not. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know we're focusing on the dinosaur scenes, but I just wanted to say that like the romances in these books too, like there are some very adorable moments and <laughs> it's enjoyable to read. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah. I, I love, I think Simon and Dalton are the, the sweetest ones because Dalton is just a chaotic puff of candy and Simon's just just as sweet so it, it was just really just me just enjoying romance and wanting to make everyone just wonderful and sweet <laughs> instead of like I don't want there to be conflict I want everyone to be happy <laughs> yeah they got the outside conflict coming yeah, coming exactly. at them <laughs> so did that that first site that you worked at doing a little bit of paleontology that you said the Perot Museum is now the one in control of or now excavating did your experience there help at all with the book? Did any like things that you learned there make their way into the book? I don't know if I go. Okay. So I have um, an alpha reader who reads like kind of as I write and she's had to politely been like, Hey, you're going to do a lot of detail about some stuff that maybe nobody cares about. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe like the casual romance reader probably doesn't want to talk about like ossified tendons in a site or whatever. And I'm like, really? Because I think it's cool. So <laughs> I, I trimmed a lot of it back because I didn't want the average everyday person to be like, wow, this is a romance book. And they would have spent like three pages talking about melanosomes or whatever, you know? <laughs> so, 
I uh, I had to trim it back quite a bit. That's funny. I could I could totally understand that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's one of the problems with a podcast. There's nobody else in the room to be like, okay, guys, <laughs> you're going too far. <laughs> Bring it back. <laughs> what I really enjoyed as a dinosaur nerd is, especially in the beginning books, when I didn't know which dinosaurs were going to appear, but you kind of leave this trail of clues. So I'm kind of I'm trying to figure out like, okay, what part of the world are they from? That gives me a clue. What okay, you mentioned feathers. So probably theropod and I'm like kind of building it up. And I think I did figure out Dalton. I also like the, these like big reveal scenes <laughs> with all the descriptions, which are definitely scientifically accurate. But then, you know, we don't know everything like we don't know that much about colors. So then you got to kind of play with that and have like, oh, there's some bright pink here. <laughs> Yeah, that was really fun. And I like later on in the books too, like uh, the, at the end of Baja's book, I had to be like, hi, so this is what spinosauruses are like as I'm writing the book, but in two weeks, they'll not be aquatic anymore or something. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of one of those things where I'm like, I'm taking some creative license and wiggle room, but trying to stay within the confines of what we know currently about this species. So I didn't want to go completely off the rails, but giving it just like a little, little flair of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I did notice that at the end of the the Baja book because the whole thing is like, oh, he's very aquatic. <laughs> and that's uh, quite a stance these days. <laughs> yeah, right? Like I accidentally like picked a side. And I was like, I wasn't. I just was keeping up with it. And now I think they're saying it's semi-aquatic or like really spent more time on land now. I don't know. Mm -hmm. like, it depends do I, who I don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly right it depends on who i'm talking to so i'm like listen i'm just a fan i do not speak for paleontologists or <laughs> i think for as like a device in a book it's good to have more diversity you know there's like a million different theropods that walk around on land having one that's more aquatic is a lot more interesting than like okay yeah it's, it's another one that's walking around like all the other ones yeah and so that was the other thing too is i didn't want to just do a bunch of tyrannosaurs and big scary theropods like i wanted to have other stuff in there because not everyone is all about the big apex predators like mm -hmm. it's like well i have to have ceratopsian because they're one of my favorites and then i've got a titanosaur later that i want to write a story about i've, I've got a i have a ankylosaur too that i want to write a short story about but i haven't introduced him yet so like i'm slowly sprinkling in all these other like variations and species so it's not just big grumpy <laughs> yeah. meat eaters mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah they are kind of grumpy <laughs> <laughs> they are the, uh, your ceratopsian regalis regalis ceratops thank you <laughs> i like how he his point of view is like yeah, these these grumpy meat eaters and life's hard for a veggie sore because like they can eat whatever kind of meat, uh, deer or whatever they can hunt. But he has to worry about his stomach reacting to the different modern <laughs> plants because it's just not used to digesting and like all these great details. It's like, yeah, you would have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I have a flashback of like that scene in the original Jurassic Park with the Triceratops who was sick because... He was eating the plants that were poisonous and stuff. And I was like, yeah, that would be tough to like get transported 65 million years into the future and all your favorite foods are gone. You're like, well, that's a rip off. Like, what am I supposed to eat now? <laughs> mm. Yeah. And then the way you've got the ones who shift into smaller dinosaurs and how they interact with the ones who shift into the bigger dinosaurs. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. If you're a micro raptor talking to someone who could turn into a T-Rex, you're going to act differently than if you're talking to someone who can turn into something more your size. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, stepping back for a second, mm -hmm. we should mention that that's sort of the, the plot is that the humans can turn into dinosaurs, right? Yeah, yeah. So how the relic guys work is that they were around during the well they've been around since the beginning of time but they've always been able to shift into different forms like kind of whatever form they needed to in order to survive and then when you know the big explosion happened all of them went underground they shifted really really tiny went underground and went like went into a deep hibernation so fast forward 65 million years of different like intervals they all started waking back up and jumped into a human form, but now they're limited. So they're thinking that the impact changed how their shifting works. So now they can't take whatever form they want. They can only go into an established human form. And then their last uh, prehistoric form that they had 
a deep connection to. Mm -hmm. And I had to wiggle that because not all of them are in the correct time during the Cretaceous for the explosion to happen, like give or take a couple billion years. So I was like, well, we're going to have to fudge that because if I, I didn't want to put such hard brackets that I couldn't do anything from the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. So like the last one that they personally connected to, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so now that's their limitations now. Gotcha. Nice. That's how you can have Spinosaurus. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I can't put that kind of like creative restriction on myself. I'm going to have to be able to do whatever I want, at least within the Cretaceous. Like we can't go back to the Jurassic. That's too far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cretaceous has plenty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Going back to your T-Rex, Montana, we've seen him in the first four books. Obviously, he's a big presence, but sounds like we're going to see a lot more of him in this last book. When it comes to T-Rex details, like how much did you play around with that? Like, did you ever think about giving him lips? So I think I played it pretty safe and was pretty vague about like, I gave him a color palette. <laughs> I didn't like super describe the lips. I, did, I didn't give him feathers. I was, <laughs> I at least was like, okay, I think as we stand right now, we're all pretty sure that T-Rex didn't have feathers. So I'm not going to give him feathers. But like the whole lip thing and all the other like, Contra like the belly ribs and stuff like that. Like, I, I don't even know if that's still argued about or if that's like cemented at this point. So I was like, this is what he looks like color scheme. And I'll leave the face up to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does he have lips? That's your interpretation. So I might get froggy and maybe tweak it before we finally like bring it live. But as it stands right now, in my head, he has lips, but I'll, I'll let the readers kind of decide if he does or not. <laughs> I yeah. feel like as time goes by, people's mental image of T-Rex changes. And now it might, for most people, be like prehistoric planet, like that T-Rex. Mm. Yeah, with, that's the one in my lips. brain. Yeah. Is that one. <laughs> the big chunky dude with lips and he's a good papa. I'm like, yeah, that's Montana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was like the first scene in prehistoric planet, too. It was like leading the little baby tyrannosaurs yeah. across. I think that was one of the first things we noticed. Like, oh, they gave that T-Rex lips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So then I just had a thought because I know in your author bio, you say you wish you could be an Allosaurus. And I was wondering, like, why Why is there no Allosaurus in the series? But Allosaurus is too far back. It's Jurassic, yeah. 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 Unfortunately, like, I, I almost did it. And I was like, no, like, I think that's pushing it. Like, it needs to be at least within the Cretaceous. So that's that's the limitations I put on myself. But mm. yeah, I man, Allosaurus, like, I think my <laughs> all-time favorite. So it's hard not to have him in the story. <laughs> How did Allosaurus become your all-time favorite? So when I was a kid, I don't know how old I was. I was young enough to be on a school bus and be very excited about going to a museum. So maybe like eight or nine or something. I remember we pulled up to the Natural History Museum in Fort Worth and outside, I hope it's still there. There's this big Allosaurus standing outside. And I remember looking out the window and seeing that thing and thinking it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I was like, and of course I thought it was a T-Rex, but then like when we got out and we like, they were explaining that it was an Allosaurus and I realized it looks so different. I was like, this is the coolest dinosaur I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So like that was in my brain. So every time I think like dinosaur, the first thing that pops in my head is an Allosaurus. So he's like my favorite. Nice. Allosaurus is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the locations, because each book is in like a totally different part of the world. But you brought up the Dinosaur Trail in Canada. We've got parts of Portugal. And then, well, Mongolia comes up a lot in terms of like the kind of fossils that come up out of there and and Myanmar because we've got the amber fossil. Oh, and, and then they're in Shanghai at one point. Yeah, there's just like so many, so many great details. And then you, in each of these places too, I think you mention a museum or a site that you could go to. So like as a dinosaur nerd, you could, you could easily read these books and be like, I'm going to go visit all these places based <laughs> on. <laughs> it's kind of like writing out my bucket list. Like I, I haven't done the trail in Canada, but that's like, before I die kind of thing. Like I want to hit all of those. I've never been to Portugal, but like I know that they've got Jurassic sites along the coast, if I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. Like I read a lot of them from like the rise and fall of the dinosaurs and things like that. So like when I read stuff like that, I'm like, there's just either one more thing I need to add to my bucket list or one more thing that I can put in my books that they can go check out. <laughs> 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 For usually both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And rise and fall of the dinosaurs, I think uh, got mentioned in one of the books. Probably. Yeah. Like I usually if it's something that I deeply love or find a lot of information from, I usually 
have to throw in Easter eggs in there. Oh, yeah, I'm like yeah. Secretly trying to like nudge people to go read it or check it out. Or <laughs> Which, by the way, thanks for mentioning us in the first book. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I was like, of course Simon would like binge read or listen to this while he's working on some fossil stuff. Like that just makes <laughs> the most sense. <laughs> I think you got you also got like Phil Curry, Riley Black. I had a running list at one point. It's like, oh, that's cool. That's <laughs> Yeah, me just fangirling out. That's that's what it is. Like anybody I think is cool, I'd put in my book somehow. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so what can readers expect in this last book in the series? So Montana is a very interesting character because he's he's very serious. He's like the big brother or the dad of the group. Heartbroken soul. He's been around for a long time. Like he's been around since Copen Marsh and went through all of that. He's, he's, you know, been around for the the boom of the of paleontology around the world. So he's a little jaded. He's tired. And he's also taking care of all these much younger shifters who haven't been around quite as long as he has. So him having to take on a new assignment with Henry, who is the super youngest, he's only been awake for about a year and he's a Albertosaurus. And he's kind of wild, has a lot to prove, gentle soul, but still kind of like figuring out how to be a human and not mess things up. Mm -hmm. He has to take him with him on this next mission, which is very, very important. And building the relationship has was really fun because Montana writing him, he did not want to put up with any of it. Like he doesn't want to, <laughs> he doesn't want to like deal with a new shifter. He doesn't want to have to deal with the fact that he's like catching feelings for this guy and of course, Henry's the opposite. Henry's just happy to be there, thinks Montana is the best, wants to do anything to make him happy. And and it was a struggle at first to write, but once I figured out their dynamic, it was just a fun slide of enjoyment. Like it was just, it, everything just came pouring out. It was a joy to write. It, I, I think I busted out laughing more than three times writing this book, just, just going like full ham with it, just <laughs> silly stuff, putting Montana in situations that made him uncomfortable is like my favorite thing in the world. So it was pretty great. And of course, being able to play with T-Rexes or like Tyrannosaurs in general and, and any type of hairy situation, super fun because they mm. have no right to be that big in any situation. <laughs> so it, it was, it was great. I, I'm hoping people really like it and, and laugh and enjoy the ride and, and like the, you know, fun paleontology stuff I sprinkled in. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask more about your experiences with the Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs and how that affects, there's a lot of talk about like repatriating fossils in these books. Oh yeah, that I'm working with them got me deeply passionate about that because I, I think naively I didn't realize how much of a problem it was until I worked with an institute where one of their core missions is regaining those fossils that have been stolen over the course of decades at this point. So that was one of the things that kind of helped me formulate the idea of the purpose of the relic team, because I knew I wanted to do something with dinosaur shifters, because of course it's fun. But I was like, but what would they be doing? Like, they, I, I didn't want to do, there's, there's a lot of tropes when it comes to shifter romances, where like, you've got these big, burly, cool shifters who are like in a motorcycle gang, or they're bouncers, or, or other professions where they have to be kind of big, me dudes who use their fists and are very, very alpha. And I was like, well, if I was going to make these big, cool prehistoric guys, I want to give them a real reason to be around. I didn't want to just give them another, like, whatever job. So, of course, it was one of those things that as soon as I thought about it, it clicked into place. I was like, well, of course, they would be passionate about making sure people know about dinosaurs because they would care that people had a much more fuller understanding of Earth history and their species and all that good stuff. So instead of them being like Indiana Jones, where they're trying to just scoop them up and take them to the museum, I'm like, they would actually care to make sure that they go back to their home country. So if they find a stolen fossil from anywhere in the world, they're going to snatch it out of whoever's hands and put it back where it belongs. Because for me, and I'm sure most of the people who listen to the show, I, I, fossils don't need to be decorations for people's houses. They need to be appreciated in their scientific accuracy and studied so we can understand more of these big, wonderful animals that capture our imaginations and that we love so much. So it's been something that I, you know, I, I, I bake into these stories and make it like a pillar of why it's so important. And I, I hope that people see that. And so, you know, when they're at museums and they're more cognizant of like, oh, that's from Mongolia. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be here. Maybe it should be back where it belongs. You know, that, <laughs> 
So, but yeah, my time with them really, they're, they're so deeply passionate about it and they do so much good work of getting these fossils back and, and celebrating it within their country that I love that. I resonated with it so much. Yeah. But then it's interesting because you set up this other group because there's more than just the core group of of shifters in this world. And then there's this mm-hmm. other group that has like a slightly different motivations. So there's some tension there. And their motivations also make sense. I don't I mean, this is definitely a spoiler, but <laughs> Yeah, spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. Um there's another group it's and you've set up kind of a giganotosaurus against a t-rex in that way too mm-hmm. which which is fun <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah it's the most epic battle like i i and it was cool too because when i was formulating kind of what i wanted the like bad guys to be i was like i don't really want another group of dinosaurs to just be bad or like i didn't want them to be black market fossil people mm-hmm. so I, I wanted to give them a real purpose so i try to not make any of the dinosaur people actually bad. I want all the dinosaurs to be good guys, or at least like morally gray at worst. Mm -hmm. So basically Origin is the other team that does other things with fossils. They're trying to figure out how to find like dinosaur DNA and figure out how to further their species and and unlock how they're able to shift and things like that. So they're not going around just destroying fossils for funsies. They're doing it because they're trying to procreate and pass down those genes that aren't getting passed around anymore. Mm -hmm. And of course, Montana and his team don't know that up until a certain point. So they're just thinking these people are just destroying fossils for no reason and they're trying to track them down. So it was fun to kind of have that situation. And in Montana's book, they have to team up, which is a joy because they don't get along. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's kind of awesome. <laughs> cool. Well, where can people buy the books? So right now, all of the Relic books are Amazon exclusive, which means they're also on Kindle Unlimited. So if you have Kindle Unlimited, they're I want to say free, but they're free with that subscription. Mm -hmm. So you can download them to your little heart's content. Otherwise, I do sell signed copies on my website, like uh, signed paperbacks. So you can go to uh, my website, masmatics.com, and grab them there. I ship all around the world. Sorry to advance for anybody in Australia because the shipping there is bad. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) everybody else is not too bad. But yeah, that's where you can find me. Great. Awesome. You mentioned your website. Are there any other places online where people can find out more about you and your work? Yeah, I am way too active on social media, specifically Facebook and Instagram. But otherwise, you can find reviews and and ratings and stuff for all of my stuff on Goodreads as well. So if you want to go peruse and check out the tags and reviews and stuff, all my stuff's there as well. Cool. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's always a delight to talk to you guys. Oh, same. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Raz, for chatting with us. It was a lot of fun to hear a bit about the behind the scenes and the research going into the books. And of course, I really enjoyed reading the series. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Wananosaurus, which was a request from Paul B via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a basal pachycephalosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Anhui, China, in the Xiaoyan Formation. It was small, it walked on two legs, it had a long tail, it had a long, thick but flat skull, and it has been depicted with bristles on its back. It also had small, densely packed bony bits on the back of the head. (laughs) (laughs) And short arms, with the humerus, the arm bone, half the length of the femur, the leg bone. The holotype was small, its femur was about 3.1 inches or 8 centimeters long. Oh, wow, that's tiny. For a pachycephalosaur? Yeah, so it's estimated to be about 2 feet or 60 centimeters long. That might make it smaller than micro pachycephalosaurus. Hoo <laughs> Undermining the name. Maybe they should have named it nano pachycephalosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends how young this one was, though. I'm not sure how young this one was. Actually, two individuals were found. The name, though, it, the whole name is Wananosaurus yanciensis, and it means Wanan lizard. It refers to where the fossils were discovered. And Wanan refers to the southern part of Anhui province, and it's an alternative name for Anhui. And the species name refers to Yanci, the town near where the fossils were found. So very descriptive of where it was found. Mm-hmm. Place name Saurus, place name Ensis. Yes. The fossils were found in 1970 by the Anhui Provincial Survey, and then they were described in 1977 by Ho Lian Hai. They found two individuals, 
including part of the skull roof and lower jaw, the leg bones, parts of the arm, and vertebrae. And the paper describing Wanonosaurus made a lot of comparisons with the Pachycephalosaur Stegosaurus. But it also said it most closely resembles Yaverlandia, which at the time was thought to be a Pachycephalosaur, but now is thought to be a Manoraptoran theropod. And it, they also said it resembled Homolocephaly. Another Pachycephalosaur. Mm-hmm. So it's a Pachycephalosaur that looks a lot like other Pachycephalosaurs. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Now, in 2009, Richard Butler and Chi Zhao re-examined Wanonosaurus, and when they studied Wanonosaurus, they noted that some of the material from the holotype and paratype were missing, so the authors based observations based on Ho's figures and description. However, they pointed out that Ho made some mistakes. For example, Ho identified the humerus as from the left side, but it was actually on the right side. But the measurements were the same. They were less than 50% the length of the femur. Still probably bipedal, like most of those headbutting dinosaurs, potentially headbutting dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. They also found that some of the bones in the skull weren't fused, so the howl type was probably a juvenile or subadult. So I guess I had an idea, wasn't an adult, at least one of the individuals. Okay, so maybe it did get bigger than Micropachycephalosaurus. But no histology has been done on it yet, so we're not 100% sure. The authors classified Wanonosaurus as Pachycephalosauria, but said that since the fossils are from juveniles, it complicates where to place it phylogenetically. So there's controversy on where it sits in the Pachycephalosaur phylogenetic tree. In the past, it's been classified, Wanonosaurus has been classified as Homolocephalidae. That's a mouthful. Yes. That family is no longer used, but they used to group together Pachycephalosaurs without domed skulls. Oh, okay. So this one did not have a domed skull. Yeah, it had a flat skull with large openings, so it was thought to be basal in the Pachycephalosauria clade. That's what you meant by a flat skull. Yeah. It didn't have the bump. Doesn't, yeah, the not dome. the dome. But Pachycephalosaurs, they're not necessarily known for the dome. They're known for the thick skull roof. So most recent studies say that Wanonosaurus is part of Pachycephalosauria, but not Pachycephalosauridae. Okay. So the thick skull roof, but not thick like Pachycephalosaurus, which had the really serious... <laughs> dome going. Yes. And our fun fact of the day is that many animals don't have any sexual size dimorphism whatsoever. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> this is based on a preprint paper on BioArchive by Tombach et al. And apparently almost no one is interested in animals where males and females are similar in size. Why do you say that? Because I googled animals where males and females are the same size and 12 out of 13 of the results on the first page are about extreme examples of <laughs> <laughs> sexual size dimorphism or ssd it's all like it's like the top result is like you won't believe how different these are I'm like i wrote same size not different sizes but yeah people really don't care the one result that actually is on the front page of google the one out of 13 <laughs> that is about the same size is this new paper which is titled, New Estimates Indicate That Males Are Not Larger Than Females in Most Mammals. Most mammals. Interesting. So for a long time, people have said that in most mammals, the males are larger than the females. Mm -hmm. And larger males do have a very slight plurality. They're the most common category, but they are less than half of the groups of mammals. Hmm. So in other words, if you add up groups where they're about the same size and groups where the females are bigger, you get a larger group than just males. So these researchers looked at over 400 species, and they estimate that males are larger in 44% of mammalian species overall, females are larger in 17%, and in 39%, they're about the same size. So there's almost as many examples of mammals where the females and males are about the same size as there are where the males are larger. That's interesting then, like what you were saying, people don't really talk about that. Yeah. Maybe because it's more of a minority thing, we think, ooh, that's interesting. It is definitely really interesting when you look at like an octopus and you see like the l really tiny little male mm -hmm. that looks like a little mini tentacle <laughs> after it attaches to the female. That's like 10,000 times the size of the male or something. Although octopoda are not mammals. Octopoda? Yeah, that's the order. Wow, that is very well done. But I, that's the most extreme example I could think of in my head. There's also a lot of variability between the groups of mammals. So in primates, Males are larger than in most species, 
many have no SSD, and only a handful have larger females, which might be a big part of why we think that in mammals, the males are bigger, because for the most part, in primates, they are. And being primates, yeah, that's what we notice when we're walking around day to day. Well, as humans, we're mostly looking at other humans. Yes. <laughs> also, as the authors put it, usually researchers study groups like carnivora, artiodactyls, and primates, but, quote, most mammals by far are rodents and bats, which are often underrepresented in the studies of SSD. Hmm. It's the second time we've mentioned carnivora. Mm -hmm. But in addition to dogs, carnivora includes cats, bears, seals, walruses, and lots of other popular big animals. Lions. Yes. I was including that in cats. Oh, uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> all... I was thinking domestic cats. <laughs> yeah, I thought about splitting it out into all the types of cats, big cats, little cats, wild cats. I was reminded because <laughs> we recently did an ep a bonus episode on Smilodon, mm -hmm. and we were talking about this. Yes, Smilodon is in Carnivora, and presumably the males may have been larger than the females, mm. because Carnivora is about as one-sided as SSD gets. In almost every single species, the males are larger than the females. Wow. And of course, these are some of the most popular animals, again, with people both casually and researchers. So again, that's probably biasing what we think of the larger males versus females. Mm -hmm. The other big group that I mentioned, artiodactyls, include giraffes, bison, camels, antelope, pigs, hippos, sheep, goats, cattle, dolphins, and whales. Big group in multiple ways. Yes. <laughs> I also like that dolphin and whales are in the same group as giraffes. It's yeah. It's funny. But those are basically all, all the other big popular animals out there, almost all of them. So again, researchers spend a lot of time on these animals, and artiodactyls are only slightly less one-sided with SSD. There are some species with larger females, but it's less than 10%. Again, it's mostly the males that are larger. Between those groups and primates getting the attention, it's not surprising that we think of males being the larger group in mammals. Mm -hmm. But what about rodents and bats? Since, as they mentioned, that's the group that really counts if you're adding up species. Yeah. So within rodents, things are much more equal. About half of rodents don't have any SSD. And since about 40% of mammals are rodents, that's a huge impact on the overall mammal number. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, then I'm thinking of squirrels or uh, friends I've had who had pet rats and yeah, no size difference. <laughs> yeah. Things are very different with bats. In something like half of bat species, the females are larger than the males. Hmm. The next biggest category for bats is no sexual size dimorphism, SSD. And only a small fraction of bat species have larger males than females. Wow. So really, if you're looking for a, a species with a really large female compared to a male in mammals, bats are a pretty safe bet. So we should also consider this with dinosaurs because there was certainly a lot of variability between different groups of dinosaurs in terms of SSD and whether it was the males or females on the larger side. There was also probably SSD in many species of dinosaurs, but there were almost certainly many examples where there was no size difference between the sexes as well. And again, with living dinosaurs or birds, males are larger than females in a lot of cases, but with birds of prey and hummingbirds, it flips. So neither of those can be extrapolated back 70 million plus years. True. But that is interesting to think about with dinosaurs. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy listening to our show, please leave a review. It really helps. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be talking about some new dinosaur discoveries. Thanks again. And until next time. Good